Well, I can't think of a nicer place to talk to you about folklore and about the role of fairy folklore in Irish culture. I'm here at a place called Kiel Kill in West Cork. And as you can see behind me, there's a lovely stone circle here and some standing stones here and, and a smaller layout of stones. And this is very typical of the Irish landscape. Um, you will find stone circles and stone constructions from cairns to uh, portal tombs all over the landscape of Ireland. And the earliest of these stone circles goes back, they date back about five and a half thousand years. And we can't really say anymore what exactly they were for, but we can uh, speculate that they were certainly involved in ritual. We know that there are certain amount of them have alignments with the solstice and the equinox. Uh, some of them when they have been excavated and many of them haven't been, but some have yield, yielded up bodies unburnt and some cremated. Um, and we can gather together that whatever uh, the function of these beautiful stone monuments, they certainly were at the centre of some kind of community ritual or celebration, that they were sacred spaces of the ancients. And it's important to recognise the um, historic authenticity about these structures, but also the role that they would play in the construction of folklore going forward. Now, sometimes if you decide that you're going to give a lecture on folklore and particularly the fairies, um, you have kind of two kinds of people. You have the cynics who will dismiss it out of hand. And then you have people who maybe get carried away by the mythical side to fairy folklore, or they have um, a sort of a picture of Tinkerbell and little Disney-like characters. Um, and it's much, much more than a Disney-fied version, and it is certainly authentic. Um, so I'm going to do my best to put this into a little bit of perspective for you and explain why the culture of the wee folk or the good folk or fairy folk is so important in Ireland, why it should be celebrated and why it should be recognised. Well, here's a place that I'm very fond of. It's called Uv Nagat, or the Cave of Cats. Um, and it's in the Rat Krohana area of Connacht, which is very much associated with Queen Maeve, but there are a lot of forts here. And uh, we'll have a look at some of those in a little while, but I thought this would be a really good place to think about who the fairies actually were, or how we should think about them. Now, this cave here behind me is considered one of the gateways to the underworld. In some literature it's called the gate to hell, which I hope it isn't, um, but more a kind of a portal into an underworld or a parallel world, which is of course very much connected with the she or the fairy folk. So let's rewind a little bit to think about who the fairies were and you know how they came about in the first place. And the first thing to think about maybe is that the concept of the fairy, even the word, um, the feminine, uh, very ethereal, uh, wispy idea of the fairy comes from 19th century literature. And it's really not what the Irish meaning of the fairy folk or the little people or the other folk uh, is, is all about. So in Irish language, these hidden people, these unseen people, Nadini Uchla, they are called the she. And the original word she meant a mound of earth. So originally it, it was actually the landscape. And then the she, Dini Nishi, um, 
became known as the people of the landscape or these invisible other world nature spirits that inhabited these sacred spaces. So first of all we have to realize how connected these beings were to the landscape, to the places that they came from. And the idea of a fairy fort or she, these mounds that were associated with these invisible people, um, represents the ubiquity of the people. You know, there aren't just four or five fairy forts in Ireland, they are everywhere. Every farmer would know where it was on his field. The story goes that if you stand on one fairy fort, you'll be able to see three others. It's almost the network or connection of the this parallel world of nature um, that is side by side with human life, but invisible to us, but, but very present. So that's the first thing is that you will see fairy forts everywhere. Um, if we think about where those fairy forts came from, I mean, in, a, in an archaeological sense, we do have the great stone cairns and monuments that the Stone Age people built. We also have these stone circles from the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, um, right up until, you know, the Viking times, we have these circular formations. And of course, in time, the, these would be um, subsumed or built upon, uh, particularly during Christian times. The early Christians loved to choose these sacred sites to build their churches and do what they could to kind of appropriate the magic of the pre-Christian period and channel it into this new message of spirituality that they were bringing. Ireland is very rich in fairy folklore and there's really two sources to it. There's an extensive mythology, uh, storytelling tradition uh, that goes back as long as we can remember. It began as an oral tradition and then continued on. It was written down by the early Christians, uh, revived again in the 19th century by the Anglo-Irish writers. And we're very familiar with that. It's fantastic. It's imaginative. It's full of all sorts of magic. And so that's one of the sources that we get our fairy folklore. But another very important source of that folklore is traditional and it comes from the customs and the uh, superstitions of local people. It's rooted in the real and one of the sources of that are the structures, the archaeology that was left behind by our ancient peoples. We can still see on the landscape evidence that they had sacred spaces and we can see carvings and all sorts of wonderful feats of engineering that they did. But then we realized that they had very special alignments to the solstice in summertime or wintertime or to the equinoxes. And naturally, these buildings were of great curiosity to future generations. They didn't quite know what they were for, but they understood that they were magical. And so storytelling was centered around these places. Then when the early Christians came and they lived in places like this, in the beehive huts and these enclosures that they built for themselves, they also were inspired by the folklore, by the traditions that uh, surrounded these very special places. And so, uh, partly in order to persuade the pagans to accept Christianity, and partly because they were so significant to those people, they often built their spiritual sites right beside the pagan sites. And in that way, the traditions and a lot of the superstitions were maintained. Sometimes they were changed, so very often a magic power that might have been attributed to a god or a, a fairy power is suddenly a cure that can be performed by a special holy person or a saint. So there was all sorts of transitions of the folklore, but ultimately it, it really comes from the landscape and it comes from the way that people moved on the landscape and the stories that they told. So these are one of my favorite features of uh, local folklore. These are called the cursing stones. They've been here for a long time. And there's a number of different traditions that are associated with them. Uh, one of them being that if you come out here to the island, and you turn the stones clockwise with the sun and you make good wishes that they will come true. 
So I'm doing that on everyone's behalf right now. You can join me, make a good wish. There we go, all the magic of Inish Murray is focused. And then there's another tradition that if you lift the cursing stones and you turn them anti-clockwise, that anything bad that you would wish upon your enemies will happen. And I'm not going to do that because we're not that kind of people. Perhaps we will vent a little frustration about the year that we've had and COVID and all of the bad luck. And I promise that I will leave all of that here and we can all return and hopefully to much better times. But it is interesting because a lot of folklore corresponds to uh, mental health and wellness ideas that we would have in modern times. For example, really the idea was to come out here and focus your anger and leave it in the stone, you know, to take it out of your body and leave it here somewhere concrete and then that you could walk away from it. And this is a technique that's still used in mindfulness and wellness, you know, that you would go to nature, leave your troubles behind and walk away. So we think that these ancient people certainly knew a thing or two about therapy. Now, obviously, you know, the Iron Age people or the Gaels or the Celts didn't necessarily understand what those rituals would have been. They just understood that these were very special, magical places. And then in storytelling, in the oral uh, recollection of what might have happened in these places, there built up a body of folklore and what we would now call fairy stories. So these people that were associated with these magic spiritual mounds or forts uh, became known as the Shi. And the Shi were a, a mischievous race of people belonging to this underworld and they could either be benevolent or helpful sometimes but often also dangerous. And a lot of these stories that built up if, if you read the stories, what you're actually witnessing is a kind of a distillation of a, a knowledge, a very landscape-rooted, farming-rooted understanding of life and an interpretation of what couldn't be understood. Things like child mortality, for example, um, things like bad luck. You know, how do you explain bad luck? In much of folklore, um, the explanation is handed over to something that you can't control, which makes everybody feel a little bit better about it. So folklore, and particularly fairy stories, are, are, are not something that's whimsical or frivolous. They are there as uh, explanations, understandings, cultural knowledge of its time that helped people navigate the world that they were in. And it's also a part of an enchanted landscape. And this might sound again frivolous, but it's only very recently that we've begun to think about a landscape as inert. You know, um, back in history, land, the stones, the trees, the flowers, were all considered to have an agency and a presence. And I think for some people anyway, who are interested in the environment, uh, it's moving back in that direction again. But certainly as far as uh, Irish people would have been concerned, the landscape had its, its lore. And remember again that most people lived uh, very locally. You know, they didn't travel very far and they walked. You know, the infrastructure, the transport network was not sophisticated. And when you had to walk, five miles to school or 10 miles to the local mart, you, you knew your landscape. And every field had its name, every rock, every river. These were all landmarks and they had a presence in the landscape. So you have this unity of landscape and of customs and traditions and then of storytelling, entertainment and folklore. And they're all interwoven um, to create this 
body of knowledge and culture that is uh, quite unique and very, very important and very, very valuable. And so the collection of this folklore, which exists in the archive in UCD in Dublin, um, represents a, a combination of pre-Christian and post-Christian traditions. Um, what was spoken about, then what was written down, what was translated, what was manipulated. Um, and to hold on to that and to make that part of our history is, is a real privilege and we owe a lot of thanks to the people who rescued it and the people who saved it. I'm standing here at the top of a fort called Ratna Tarov and as luck would have it, just as I began recording this, a man across the fields in his digger decided to get very busy, but I hope you can hear this okay. Um, Ratna Tarov means the fort of the bull and this is connected with the Thorn, the Thornbo Kulina or the raid of the brown bull of Kuli. And this is a massive story which is part of the scale of Queen Maeve of Connacht. And the Tawn both begins here with Queen Maeve and her husband uh, weighing up their property and Maeve deciding that she's equal in almost all circumstances except for this one bull that she's going to get from Ulster. And it also ends here, uh, this raid for the brown bull of Cooley caused a, a, a huge saga of heroic deeds by Cú Cullen and this Cahawk or war between Queen Maeve of Connacht and the Ulster people. So it's a very important story in the uh, mythological cycle of Ireland. And this whole area around here, Rathcrohan, is associated with Queen Maeve and with that mythology. This area here is the uh, old royal headquarters of Connacht. So it was where the high kings and queens of this part of Ireland uh, had their inaugural ceremonies and their rituals. So it is, uh, like, like we said earlier, you know, you're standing here on one fort and you can see Rathcrohan, which is another big fort area over there in the distance. So it's no wonder when these uh, structures are so connected with the old mythological cycles of Ireland that they also made their way into the folklore of Ireland and they've always been considered by people to have a very important spiritual energy. Almost everything we know in terms of narratives and stories has come to us through a filter of Christianity and whatever the old stories were like before um, they were brought into a culture of writing uh, we, we only know them now because of what, what was written down in the manuscripts, manuscripts like the Book of Invasions. So from the arrival of the early Christians here, St. Patrick came here in the 5th century. From the 5th century to the 12th century, there was a manipulation, an altering of those pagan stories uh, to integrate them into the framework of a, a Christian history. A couple of examples of that. In the Laura Gowala or the Book of Invasions, there is a connection made with the first people who came to Ireland and Noah and Noah's Ark. So it is almost to give Irish prehistory some sort of a biblical connection. And obviously the early Christians had no control over what had happened pre-Christianity. So they did their best to kind of find a way to incorporate it into um, the, the similar pre-Christian stories that still had a biblical context. We see the origin story of the fairy folk in these kind of terms. Uh, it is given that the fairies were originally the Tuha de Danon, and the Tuha de Danon went to war with a human tribe that came to Ireland. And the price for uh, being conquered in that war was to have to participate in the invisible world or the spirit world. So one of the stories of the origin of the fairy folk is that they are the Tuatha de Danann, 
that they had to or were forced out of the human surface world by the Fomorians and you know who had become the, the Milesians and the Irish human race. Um, but that they're still there, that the fairies are these two had the Danon and they are present in nature, they are present in the rivers and the trees and the forests. They have their own parallel existence, they have their own sports, they have their own funerals, they have their own music. And again, their presence is located in the, the mounds, the she, it's located within nature. So that's one of the origin stories of, of the little folk. But another powerful origin story is that they are fallen angels. Uh, when God uh, kicks out Lucifer from the realm of heaven, he also evicts others. And, and they, as they fall down, he uh, commands them to remain where they are. So they remain in the air, they remain in the river. These spirits are doomed never to go into heaven. And that's who the fairy folk are. And this is also a story that you will find in other fairy mythology in Norway, for example, in other European countries. But the thing is that in both contexts, in both circumstances, we see this conflict being waged between what we know and what we can see, almost the realm of the intellect, and then the realm of the unknown, the realm of nature, uh, the mysterious, the inexplicable. And people have used this existence of an ex inexplicable uh, world to, to help them deal with very much the, the inexplicable. Uh, many of us will rely on religion to explain what we cannot understand. Uh, why people die, for example, why people fall ill. Uh, karma, we believe that if you're a good person that you will get your reward. If you're a bad person, you'll be punished. Now, as Christian as those ideas might sound to us, um, they are also very potent and very powerful and very present in pre-Christian uh, systems and in many other systems. So the idea behind the fairy folklore, this, this concept of being some sort of a moral compass, the, that the fairy stories lead us to think about the less privileged in our communities. For example, very often fairy stories will highlight the reward of some liminal people, elderly people or widowed people. Very often good deeds for these people uh, are rewarded by the fairies and uh, by the same token um, uncharitable or hostile attitudes towards the liminal people of society are severely punished by the little people. So th this folklore is not a whimsical uh, construct simply for entertainment. Fairy folklore has a function in society. It has a function for uh, enabling certain old and trusted ideas about morality, about good and evil, um, about doing the right thing within your community to function, whether it is in, in terms of stories for children or in stories about protecting the environment, which is also one of the really strong themes in fairy folklore. Don't interfere with the trees, don't interfere with fairy pathways, don't build, don't develop, don't put your faith in things. Um, they are not the, the source of joy or happiness. This is Latoon in County Clare. If you look behind me here, you can see a very busy motorway. Um, it's there about 20 years, but uh, there was quite a ruckus created in 1999 when a local storyteller called Eddie Lenehan objected to the building of this motorway because it was going to result in the cutting down of a fairy bush, a hawthorn bush. And Eddie claimed that according to folklore, 
This bush was where the Munster fairies met before they went to war with the Connacht fairies. Um, and he created a stir about it. He wrote a letter to the Irish Times, which was in turn picked up by the New York Times. And of course, this became uh, quite a conversation piece. And many people were a bit embarrassed by it. They thought, you know, it brought up the worst of the um, stage Irishness of, of fairy folklore. However, here's the point. These sites that are associated with folklore also carry in them the, the customs, the traditions of the area. And I can't speak for Eddie Lenehan myself, and he's well able to do that himself, but it's more than just uh, believing in, in a ritual. It's also preserving the places, um, the locations of these rituals as a very important uh, element of folklore. And while people may have been embarrassed, or some people might have been embarrassed by it, uh, the fact is that the motorway was rerouted, the ferry bush survived, and to the best of my knowledge, it's still down there. And that means that the story goes on, and therefore it's kept in the folklore memory. So I think we owe a, a debt of uh, gratitude to Eddie Lanahan and the work that he does. The other thing that I'll say is that, you know, over the last 20 years, we have become intensely aware of uh, the significance of our, of our environment. And what might have seen um, mythical uh, or a little bit ridiculous back in the past now seems like a very wise strategy of protecting our wildlife, uh, protecting nature from um, the more modern effects that uh, have come in with industrialization. So, you know, I would uh, just draw your attention to the fact that the motorway was built, but the hawthorn tree survives. And so the fairies of Munster can still go to war with the fairies of Connacht, if that's what you believe. You might be interested to know how the Irish folklore collection was assembled and why, a little bit about the history about collecting folklore in Ireland. There is a magnificent archive in University College Dublin where thousands and thousands of stories were collected, stories that the old folk knew. And this uh, collection was um, organised by a man called Seamus Delargy. And he had the foresight to see that if somebody didn't write down all of the old stories, uh, they would just disappear. So he went to Eamon de Valera in the 1930s and he, he said himself that he felt that the house was on fire and that he had a burning urge to save, to save the oral knowledge that the old folks had. And quite rightly, he was aware that industrialization and modernization often see the depletion of uh, oral cultures like this. Um, so it was a very wise decision to go out and record and write down uh, what customs and traditions, what foodstuffs, what religious, reli uh, what religious rituals, you know, the material culture, the oral culture, the customs and the traditions in various communities. And so this was done uh, in 1935 and not only were school children asked to come in with their stories but also uh, there were local people who were hired to go and collect the stories and, and this is really important I think because it had to be local people you can imagine if somebody was to come in from outside of a community and start asking people, you know, did you make putching here or, you know, what kind of things did you get up to in the past? Um, in many small communities, outsiders wouldn't be trusted. So it was really wise to uh, 
trust local people to gather and collect the information. So that archive is there now in University College Dublin and many, many scholars use it on a daily basis uh, to investigate how culture functions. Um, and, and fairy folklore is definitely part of that body of information. And when we think about the fairies, we really have to think about the function that um, this belief of an invisible community that lived parallel lives to us what was operating in society. Why did people think that? Uh, was it to do as, with a sort of a moral compass? Was it encouraging? Um, you know, uh, children often have imaginary friends. Is it in some way healing? Is it good for mental health to believe that there is a thin veil between our community and people that we can't see? Um, so fairy folklore is part of all that and much, much more. And as we travel around and look at the forts and the sites and you hear some of the stories associated, please keep in mind that the story itself is the entertainment part of it. But the function of those fairy tales and the function of passing those tales down from generation to generation is much, much more important and very, very interesting.